Hello and welcome back everyone. I'm Jason and today we're going to dive into the amazing world of the human body. You know, my first love was actually chemistry and physics, but as I get older, almost everything I learn about biology is honestly just as interesting. So it's sort of like a new love of mine. And today I'd like to get up close and personal with something you might not think about very often, but it's always out there just hanging out in the background, quietly doing its job. Yes, you probably guessed, I'm talking about earwax. The sticky, gooey stuff always in our ears, just doing its own thing. Now, before you start reaching for those Q-tips, and spoiler alert, you probably don't want to do that anyway, let's dive into the waxy world of this often overlooked bodily substance. Why do we have earwax? What is it actually made of? And is it really as gross as it sort of seems? Today we're going to get to the bottom of these really sticky questions. Now first, I'd like to just start with the basics. What exactly is earwax? Well, the scientific name for earwax is actually called cerumen, which sounds a lot fancier than that gunky stuff in my ears. Earwax is a naturally produced substance made by glands in the outer part of the ear canal. It's actually a mixture of dead skin cells, hair, and secretions from two types of glands, the ceruminous gland and the sebaceous gland. Now, the ceruminous glands are a type of sweat gland that produce a waxy, oily substance, while the sebaceous glands produce an oily substance called sebum. When these secretions mix with the dead skin cells that are just naturally in that area and the tiny hairs in your ear canal, then you have what we commonly call earwax. Now you might be wondering, as I was wondering, why in the world do our bodies continually make this stuff? What purpose does it serve? Well, it turns out that earwax isn't just some useless gunk up there. It's actually a pretty crucial part of our ear health. Now, first and foremost, earwax serves as a physical protective barrier. It helps to keep dust, debris, and even tiny insects from making their way into the deeper part of your ear. I want you to think of this as a sort of like a sticky security guard catching potential intruders before they can get in and really cause any trouble. Now, it's easy for us to forget because we mostly sleep indoors in a clean environment, but if you imagine thousands of years ago sleeping outside every single day, dirt getting into your ears is something that happens really quickly, and insects are just something you're constantly battling. So you can kind of think of earwax as sort of like being your natural glue trap, keeping these tiny critters from getting inside of your ear canal. But that's not all. Earwax also has some incredible antimicrobial properties. It contains something called lysozyme, which is an enzyme that can break down the cell walls of certain types of bacteria. This means that earwax actually helps to prevent ear infections by keeping harmful bacteria at bay. Again, it's really easy for us to forget this because it's been many years since I've had any kind of an ear infection. But if you've ever had ear pain, it is no joke. If you have a raging ear infection, especially for a young child, it is extremely painful and it's impossible to sleep, to rest, or to do anything when you have an infection putting pressure on your eardrum like that from the inside. Nowadays, we basically just prescribe antibiotics or some sort of drops if necessary, and we can kill what's in there. So the fact that we have a first line of defense from bacteria by your earwax actually able to, through an enzyme, break down the cell wall of certain kinds of bacterial, to me is something that I didn't initially know and is actually really cool defense mechanism that we have in our ears. Now, another important function of earwax is actually lubrication. The skin inside your ear canal is actually quite delicate, and without earwax, it gets very dry and itchy and prone to irritation. So earwax really helps this skin stay moisturized and healthy. Lastly, earwax plays a big role in our body's natural cleaning process for the ears. As you go about your day talking, moving your jaw, chewing, and things like this, these actions actually help move the old earwax from the inner part of the ear canal to the outer part where it eventually falls out or gets washed away. You can think of it sort of like a conveyor belt for ear cleanliness. And as you probably know, we're constantly shedding dead skin cells all the time. Most of the dust that you see 
in any room or on a table surface, when you look at it, is actually dead skin cells from one form or another, right? Also sometimes hair and things like that. So on the inside of your ear canal, you're constantly shedding dead skin cells. If you didn't have a way to get it from the inside in the tiny canal to the outside, I mean, you would just eventually have plugged up ears. So this moving of your jaw, the constant motion that's happening is generally always moving that sticky earwax from the inside to the outside, kind of like constantly cleaning away the dead skin cells that we're shedding. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I get it. Earwax is pretty useful, but can you have too much of a good thing? And the answer is, of course, you might guess yes. Some people do produce more earwax than others, and in some cases, it can be a really big problem. In fact, excessive earwax production or impaction, where the wax really gets stuck and built up inside of there, can lead to symptoms like obviously earaches, a feeling of fullness inside of the ear, actually can lead to partial hearing loss and tinnitus, which is that ringing that sometimes people get in their ears. This can be accompanied by itching and even dizziness in severe cases. If you're experiencing any of these symptoms, give your doctor a call. Now here's an interesting question. How much earwax do we actually produce? Well, of course, as you might guess, it varies from person to person, but on average, the human body produces about one and a half to two grams of earwax per month. That's roughly the weight of a paperclip per month. Now over a year, that obviously adds up, but it adds up only to about 20 or 25 grams or so, which is about as much as a couple of grapes that you might hold in your hand, again, per year. So it's not exactly a wax factory up there, but it's enough to keep things running smoothly. Now here's something I find fascinating. It actually turns out that there are really two different types of earwax. So we have what we call the wet earwax and also the dry earwax, and which type you have in your ear is really governed by your genetics. Now, the wet earwax is golden or dark brown and quite sticky, while the dry earwax is more of a light gray or a tan color, and it has sort of a flaky consistency. The wet type is more common of people from African or European descent, while the dry type is predominant in East Asian populations. But why do we have a difference in the first place? Well, we don't know all the answers, but it all comes down to a single gene called ABCC11. Um, this gene affects the production of a protein that influences the consistency of the earwax. A mutation in this gene results in the dry earwax. Now you might be wondering if this difference actually serves a real life purpose. Is there some advantage? For instance, is one type of earwax better suited to certain environments or are they basically the same thing? Again, we don't know all the answers, but some researchers suggest that the dry type of earwax might have evolved as an adaptation to colder climates. So the theory goes that the dry earwax might be less likely to freeze in cold temperatures, which could have been very advantageous for the early humans migrating to colder regions. However, it's important to note that both types of earwax serve the same basic functions, that is protecting the ear canal, trapping debris, helping prevent infections. The difference in consistency doesn't seem to significantly impact these primary roles. I'll tell you one interesting thing though, this gene ABCC11, it doesn't just affect earwax, it's also linked to, drum roll, body odor. So people with dry earwax tend to have less body odor. Right? And this connection has led some scientists to speculate, again, just speculation, that the prevalence of the dry earwax gene in the East Asian populations might be due to a sexual selection. In other words, a preference for partners with less body odor. So whether you're rocking the wet wax or keeping it dry, your earwax is always doing its job. It's honestly just another example of the diversity in human biology that can come with a slight change to a single gene. Basically, all humans are like 99.999999, whatever it is, percent similar, or basically exactly the same. These tiny, tiny variations in little genes might affect you know, certain things like earwax or you know, eye color or things like that, you know, giving us some variety. Variety is the spice of life, so to speak, right? And they could have some advantages in certain climates or certain areas, but in general, all of us humans are basically all almost completely identical. And sometimes uh, a gene or a few genes uh, a tiny change to them can affect multiple attributes on the outside, but usually they're only completely superficial, like in the case of the earwax. 
Now, one thing I was wondering is if earwax serves a similar purpose to the mucus that we all have in our nose. Now, while they do have and share some similarities, for instance, both are protective secretions, both help trap debris, both have antimicrobial properties. They're not exactly the same. Mucus in the nose, for instance, is primarily composed of water, proteins, and something called glycoproteins. And it plays a crucial role in humidifying the air that we breathe. And of course, trapping the airborne particles in that we breathe before they get to our lungs. Now, earwax, on the other hand, is more focused on protecting the ear canal specifically, and it doesn't have the same air filtering functions. All right, now let's address what we call the elephant in the room, so to speak, the question on everybody's mind. Many people, including me sometimes, uh, use these cotton swabs to clean out our ears. But here's the thing, it's actually not really a good idea. It's not recommended, right? In fact, it can actually do more harm than good in some cases. So here's the thing, when you stick a Q-tip or a cotton swab into your ear, what you're doing is you risk pushing the earwax deeper into the ear canal. Potentially this causes what we call impaction. And so you could accidentally, in this case, puncture your eardrum if you push too far, which is definitely not a fun experience. Plus, remember how the main function of earwax is a protective barrier? Well, if you're pushing and impacting it into the center, then that can remove much of that protective layer, leaving your ear canal itself vulnerable to infection. So if you're really not recommended to use Q-tips or cotton swabs to clean your ears, then how should you actually clean your ears? Well, for most people, the answer is pretty simple. You really don't need to clean your ears. Even though you kind of want to, and sometimes it itches, you don't need to. They're sort of self-cleaning. Remember, if you are chewing, the natural migration of the earwax is forced outward, aided by these movements of our jaw that we do every day. And it takes care of most of the cleaning for you. Now, if that's not doing it for you, if you feel like you have excessive earwax, the safest way is actually to use a damp washcloth on the outside of the ear during a bath or a shower with hot water. Now what the warm water does is it helps to soften any of the earwax near the outer ear, making it easier to wipe away gently. And for those who do produce excessive earwax or experience frequent blockages, there are over-the-counter ear drops that can help soften the wax, making it easier for it to come out and easier for it to be cleaned by warm water when you're in the shower. These products typically contain ingredients like mineral oil, glycerin, or even hydrogen peroxide. So there you have it, the waxy wonder that is earwax. From its protective properties to its self-cleaning capabilities, it's clear that this is an often overlooked part of our body, but it plays a crucial role in our ear health. And to be honest, I never thought I would do a video on earwax. When I started thinking about it and researching it, you know, it's like, uh, there's just more and more and more to it. So I thought it was interesting. So I'd like to thank you for hanging out with me. I really do appreciate your comments. Please drop me a line. Let me know what you think. I read every single comment. Let me know if you want more detail or less detail, what other topics you might be interested in. Please do drop me a line because I read everything and I do take it into consideration. So until next time, keep your ears waxy and remember to always stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.